With that, I'll introduce Nate Franzine. Nate, uh, the First Dakota is the head of the, the Ag Division at First Dakota. Uh, we've been with, with First Dakota since 2010. Uh, it's been a great move for us. They've been a, a great partner in helping us finance all of the expansion and, and progressive things that we want to do. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Nate. All right. Thank you, Craig. I get the uh, after lunch session, so uh, put me in the prime slot. I appreciate that very much. Um, I look forward to just sharing a few thoughts with you here uh, this afternoon. Um, I'm going to try and connect this morning's discussion, all that uh, technical uh, genome and uh, genetics to dollars, right? At the end of the day, we got to make them dollars so that, uh, so that it works for our operation. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and take you there. And the other thing I want you to think about maybe as a backdrop to my talk is sustainability. Anybody heard that in the industry lately? Yeah, right? We, everything you hear from the consumer side, right, um, is all about sustainability. And it certainly is within the industry too. But we're talking sustainability. What does that mean? What's that mean to all of you in the room as it relates to, uh, to beaver genetics? Um, quickly, I want to share a couple things about our bank. For those of you that aren't familiar with us, I won't take long here, but I do want to share a couple things that we think make us a little different. Uh, number one, we're the oldest bank in the Dakota Territory. Uh, family owned, the Ness family has controlling interest. Uh, other shares owned by current and past officers of the bank primarily. So uh, local ownership, we're now up over uh, one and a half billion in assets, and we're approaching rapidly a billion dollars to agriculture. So uh, one of the larger ag banks in the country, 375 employees bank wide, 19 locations, six loan production offices. We have 50, 50 folks in our ag division, and uh, Craig earlier mentioned Adam. Adam's in the room and will be around too and would love to visit with you. Adam's one of 50 folks that make up our ag lending team in the bank. Just last week, we were off uh, as a team for a couple days planning for the coming year. Every year we do that strategic planning. One of the things that makes us different, we have a department within our ag division called Dakota Mac. Dakota Mac is focused on three things. Uh, the biggest one is long-term fixed rate financing. So if you're buying real estate or long-term capital expenditures, we have the ability to help you manage your interest rate risk and uh, lock in those rates so you don't have to worry about what the Fed does and what rates do between now and, and uh, after you get, make that purchase happen. Uh, we, are, we were the first preferred lender in the country with Farm Service Agency, something we're very proud of, especially in the economic times we're in right now where things have tightened up a bit. That program is tremendously valuable to us. It helps us hang with uh, farmers and ranchers much longer than we'd be able to without that program. So uh, very important to us. Iron Country is a machinery and equipment financing program that's very competitive as well. One of the new things we rolled out here a few years ago, actually our fourth class is going on right now, is a, a beginning farmer program. And, and much different than most financial institution beginning farmer programs, it's not about a low interest rate, it's not about special products, it's about education. So the way our beginning farmer program works is if you're a young farmer or rancher, uh, you apply to get in. Every other year we do a, do a, a class uh, that class uh, meets four times throughout the year. They're multiple day sessions, and we, uh, we try and bring in some of the best in the nation to educate and sharpen the management skills of young producers. So it's all about how do we help the next generation get as prepared as possible to uh, take over their farms and ranches, and not just take them over, but be successful, take them to the next level, so to speak. And so that's what our beginning farmer program is all about. Seeing a few youngsters in the room, if you're interested, here's what it costs. Uh, you put a $1,000 deposit up, up front, and every program you get to and uh, you're engaged in, we refund 250 back. So anybody good at math in the room? What's the program cost? Zero if you show up, right? If you show up to all four sessions, participate, it doesn't cost you a dime, and uh, we're really proud of that program. It's really been a big success. Our group right now uh, has three behind them, and their fourth session will be coming up here in December. Uh, one other thing I want to touch on that I, we think is unique to us is a consulting department in our ag division called Keep Farmers Farming. Uh, it's a legacy consulting department. Uh, they focus on a couple different things. Number one, estate planning. So we're helping uh, farms and ranches get their estate plans in order. That's easy, right? I've, I, uh, I've talked to a few in the room already today about it to say... Uh, 
You know, uh, I thought it was hard getting in the business, but man, getting out of the business is harder yet, right? How do we transition it? How do we make sure the next generation is good to go? We're helping folks with that uh, every day. One of the things we've learned is we're not attorneys and we're not accountants, but we do understand agriculture and we do understand what goes on in the family dynamic and a family business. And so we work closely with those families to set things up the way they want them so that uh, whenever that time comes where that estate plan kicks in, it works the way they want it to. It happens the way they would like. The other thing we're doing in that program, we call it our Agri Excellence Program. That's kind of everything in the kitchen sink. One of the things that we've learned as we help people uh, with their estate planning is it's really hard to transition a business that has issues, or it's really hard to transition a business that isn't quite functioning as good as we'd like it to. So we end up providing consulting services in a lot of other areas too, everything from strategic planning, uh, succession and transition, that is different than estate planning. Estate planning is the legal documents that you need to put in place to make it happen. Uh, succession and transition, that's more about the people side of it. How do we make sure everybody knows the role and everybody's doing what's supposed to get done and we're doing that in a way that makes our business run effectively and profitably, okay? Uh, labor, we're constantly in that labor uh, uh, challenge working with our farms and ranches. How do we make sure they've got the labor the way they want it? Financial management, obviously as bankers, that's one uh, we think we know something about. And then uh, marketing confidence. We're not marketing advisors, but we have started putting together marketing groups, uh, area producers that all come together on a regular basis and we help them sharpen their marketing skills and gain marketing confidence. Really, it's all about confidence, right? Am I confident enough to pull the trigger and make that decision? And do I believe I've got good information to do it? So that's what our consulting group is up to. Um, as you can see, one thing in mind, enhancing the legacy of your farm or your ranch, okay? So uh, all things that uh, we think are real important. If you're interested in our newsletter, we kick a newsletter out on a regular basis, very much targeted at knowledge and information for you to help make your uh, business better. Let us know, we'll get you on that. And then I'd also direct you to our website. We've got lots of resources on our website, all geared towards uh, the farm and ranch. So uh, again, firstdakotaag.com. Let me talk about sustainability then. What do you think about when you think of sustainability? Right? We all think of something different, don't we? What does sustainability really mean? Well, a lot of people immediately go to environment, don't Environmental, natural resources. What's it mean to be sustainable? Are we taking care of the environment or, you know, are, are we leaving it better than we got it? Whether that's our grazing practices, our farming practices, nutrient management, all those things come up when you start talking about sustainability. How about production efficiency? The things we talked about this morning, was any of that about production efficiency? Yeah, it was, wasn't it? And, and the, the more efficient we can do things, the more sustainable we are, right? The more we can get out of that valuable natural resource, um, the more sustainable we are. So from an environmental standpoint, certainly. A lot of times I think about it from an industry-wide standpoint. How do we make sure our industry is sustainable for the long term? Uh, supply and demand, right? Number one, we have to have consumers providing demand, and then we also have to be able to meet that demand with our supply. We'll talk about more about that here in just a, a, a minute. And I think you'll find some of that data kind of interesting, how we'll maybe tie that back. Capital, is it important? Do we need capital in the, in the business? Yeah, we, you bet we do, right? We need equity capital, we need debt capital, we need human capital, right? We need talented, skilled human capital to understand what we're doing with all these genetics, what we're doing to maximize our resources. Uh, so I touch on a few of those there. Foundations, money, that provides capital. Obviously the solvency of the businesses within the industry. Education, you know, I, I look at the U.S. and say, why are we considered the best in the world in agriculture? It's a lot of reasons, right? We've got some really good natural resources. Our river system, the quality of our land, the quality of our cattle. Uh, we're really blessed there, aren't we? But look at our land grant system. We're the only country in the world that has put in place a system designed to research and develop agriculture. So big, big reasons that set us apart. And then leadership, our leadership training. In South Dakota, we have South Dakota Ag and Rural Leadership. John's wearing the hat today, but uh, other states have it as well, right? Nebraska lead, every state around here has a, a leadership program that I, I think really, really helps uh, build on um, making our industry viable. And then uh, this Thursday, SDSU's first home football game. Anybody going? I know there's gonna be some in the room going. Uh, that day we'll break ground on the new uh, ADRDL 
facility, right? Research lab, disease control, pretty important to sustainability, isn't it? So again, all these things are cogs that make our industry sustainable for the long term. I'm going to talk about producer sustainability in just a bit, and that's where we'll drill down to this morning's talk and what's it really mean to you. But let me give you a little big picture first. Let's talk about supply and demand, our market, and what, uh, what's driving our market. So here's the supply side. You guys know these numbers. For years, we were, we were moving downward in the cow inventory, weren't we? That that's trend is reversed. And uh, in recent years, you've seen that. The last couple of years, we're on the upward trend, and projections show we're going to continue on that upward trend. Here's the other thing that we all know has happened on the supply side, right? Look at the carcass weights. Average live weight is the blue bars from 1990 to 2015. We know we're able to put more carcass weight on those critters, right? Again, why are we able to do that? Genetics, right? Genetics is a big part of that. So uh, this morning's talk really plays into the supply side, doesn't it? Let's talk about demand. This is kind of fun to look at. And I, this is what gives me long-term optimism for agriculture, long-term optimism for all of you in the room. And today, especially when it's a little harder to make a buck, um, maybe it's good to pause every once in a while and say, is there anything to be optimistic about for the long run? And I'm going to show you here, I really think it, there is. We all know this one, right? World population growth, we're at 7.5 billion today and growing. Uh, projected to be up in the 10 billion range by 2050. That in and of itself, is that a good thing for us? A few yeah, heads nodding. I would agree. It's a good thing, right? More, more mouths to feed. But I would make the case that this is only a small part of what we really need to be looking at, especially all of you in the, uh, in the beef business. Where's, where's beef on the uh, food chain? Is it on the low end? No, it's up on the high end, right? You're considered a premium, premium product to consumers out there. Uh, and so something for us to think about. The next two slides are pretty mind-boggling to me. So these are slides that show um, global population and the percent of the global population that's considered to be in extreme poverty. Okay, And extreme poverty is living off of less than two bucks a day. Any of you live off of two bucks a day? I wish I could say I can, but I don't think I'm going to get very far on two bucks a day. So this is a percent of the population. It goes all the way back to 1820. But what I really want you to hone into on is look at, look at recent years. Let's even say from the 80s, 1980 to today. Look at how fast that is dropping. We have pulled people out of poverty across the planet way faster in the last 20, 25, 30 years than any time in history. That's a big deal. I'm going to get to that in a second. That's a really big deal. Here's another way of looking at it. So this is a picture of the population on the planet. Red is who is in extreme poverty. Green is those folks not in extreme poverty. Folks that have moved out of poverty. Look at how fast that green chart is moving up, right? Look at that green grow compared to that red that keeps shrinking. This is a really big deal to U.S. agriculture. But I would make the case it's even a bigger deal to cattle, people in the cattle business, okay? You're on the top of the food chain. Everybody, you know, we, uh, we like to think lobster is the premier product, right? It isn't. It's that ribeye that we looked at on this morning, right? That's the premier product out there. That's what everybody wants to eat. So people moving out of poverty is really, really beneficial for our long-term demand. Here's some numbers that I will really drive that home. Middle class, growing middle class. I'm going to show you China numbers here in the next slide, but let's talk about this. Two billion people uh, believed to be in the middle class in 2012. It's projected to go to almost five billion by 2030. Look at how fast we're moving people into the middle class. Global spending on food. These numbers just kind of blow me away. In 2011, the global consumer spent 3.6 trillion on food. Look where that's going in not even 10 years. 2020, that's only two and a half years from now. That's going to hit 7.3 trillion is what they're projecting. So that's more than doubling in 10 years. That's a good thing for cattle, for the cattle business, right? That's a good thing for beef consumption. More people in the middle class raising their, their diet. And you can see those emerging countries. Look at China. So 2012... 
3% of the population of China was considered in affluent in 2012. 14% were in the upper middle class, 54% in what they call the mass middle class, the majority of middle class folks in China. And then you still have 29% considered to be in that poor category. Look at where it's headed. Look at where 2022 is. 9% affluent, so that triples uh, just in 10 years. Look at the upper middle class. It goes to 54%, right? 14% to 54%. That's a lot of folks now able to afford beef. It's a lot of folks now going to have a steak instead of chicken feet, Right? or whatever else they eat over there. Some of you have been there. You know that uh, you can find some interesting food over there in China. Look at those numbers. 1.4 billion folks. Uh, what's the U.S.? We're not even to a half a billion, are we? So a lot of mouths to feed there, and that's why we look at China, right? Just because of the sheer numbers. Look at just meat consumption, total meat consumption in China, going back to 1975. The blue bar is swine. They love, their, they love their swine over there, right? By the way, did anybody know, anybody in the swine business in the room? Anybody finish some hogs? Okay. Anybody know that China is now the largest producer of swine in the world? They've passed us, okay? China, China raises more hogs than we do. And uh, you can see why when you look at uh, how much they like their swine. But look at the beef. Beef's growing as well. Have we read anything in the news lately about opening markets to China? Absolutely. That's a big deal to all of us in this room, right? Because our product's going to have more demand for it. That's going to put dollars back to us in the long run. Uh, those of you that raise feed, which I know you all do to some degree, look at the increased demand for feed because of that increased demand for meat. Uh, that's a good thing for us as well. So this all really plays into our future, future demand. Another way to look at demand, per capita net meat consumption. Okay, this is all meats, but look at how we were on the downward trend for years there. In the early 2000s, folks were eating less meat per capita. That's, that's reversed here recently. We are now eating more meat and projected to continue up. Let's look at it strictly on the beef side of things. Here's beef. So this is for you guys exactly. We'd been on that downward per capita, now that's turned. So those are good signs to me. This gives me long-term optimism for your business, right? More people in the middle class, growing population, and per, per capita consumption going up. That's all good news for, for our demand as we look to the future, okay? So now let me drill into your level. Let's talk about sustainability at the producer level. What are the things that really make you sustainable for the long term? Obviously, I'm going to focus in on the financial viability. I'm a banker, right? That's what I spend most of my time looking at is how do we make sure all of you can uh, pay your bills, pay us back, and have a profit at the end to live comfortably. Uh, cost controls, record keeping and budgeting, enterprise analysis, capital expenditure planning. You know, Craig didn't just all of a sudden go build these barns on a whim, right? There was a lot of planning that went into that. There's a plan behind it and a reason for that investment. Uh, and then you're going to spend more time on this this afternoon. How do you maximize that revenue? Marketing skills, but also what we talked about a minute ago, production efficiency. How do we get more for less? How do we get more, more, more volume to sell um, with less resource? Control your controllables. What do we mean by that? Well, I'm going to hit on a slide and I'm going to come back to that control your controllables. This is a little bit of a busy chart, but I'm going to point out one thing. Here's the reason I wanted to share this, and I mentioned it's a little harder to make a buck today. This is my evidence. This is proof to me that that's the case. Uh, the blue line is what I want you to focus on. That is the percent of First Dakota ag customers that made money each year going back to 2002, okay? And when I say made money, I'm talking about accrual adjusted real profit, depreciation factored off, okay? They... they they still might have, some of those that lost still might have been able to cash flow, but they weren't able to uh, make enough to uh, cover their depreciation expense, the need to keep updating equipment and updating their facilities. So go back to 2002. If you remember, uh, back then it was kind of tight too. 64% of our customers made money in 2002. 
you can see what's happened since, right? It spiked up, and we, we've been in some pretty darn good times. Um, a lot of the economists out there would call this period in time a super cycle, right? One of the few golden eras of agriculture where we just made money. We didn't have to hardly think, and we were able to make money, right? The margins were there. The markets were there. The demand was there. We peaked out at 93% of our clients making money back in uh, 2000 and. 12, I think it was, okay? Where are we at today? 49%. So about half of our customers are losing money today. About half of our customers are making money this past year. We, no secret to us, right? Commodity prices have dropped. Margins have really tightened. Now more than ever, all this efficiency stuff that we're talking about is really, really important. We really have to know where we're putting our dollars so that we can uh, make a little money at the end. So what can you control? I'm not stupid. I know where I'm at, right? You can control what breed you use. There's Bieber Red Angus right there, right? You can control the cattle. Why, why do you want to control that? And we talked about that this morning. I thought it was really great, right? You're making long-term decisions based on the bulls you select today. Why is that important? Here's just one reason. Look at what carcass weights have done since 1980. Average carcass weights, 707 to 892. Does genetics matter? Absolutely, right? We better keep up with this. If you don't keep up with that, are you, are you competitive? Are you still in business? I thought it was interesting. I don't know if all of you caught the dairy comment this morning, the, the, the amount of uh, data the dairy businesses used. I grew up on a, on a dairy farm about uh, 60 miles east of here. We milked 100 cows, and back then uh, we were pretty big. That was a big dairy. What do you, what do you got to be today to be efficient and to be competitive? You know, a thousand cow dairy is considered small today. It's amazing. Well, that, that's, you know, there's a lot of other factors into it, but certainly when they know how to gain efficiencies, those folks that are quick adapters and really become efficient because of the genetics, because of the data, because of the things they can control, they become more competitive. They, they weed out the less efficient, right? We're still in a commodity business. Efficiency always wins in a commodity business. Quality is still important though, isn't it? And now more than ever, there are niche markets out there and we see that our clientels are finding ways all the time to develop a niche, to get paid a premium for quality. So quality certainly still continues to be a big part of the equation. At the end of the day, many of you have been in the cattle business a long time. Is the cattle business cyclical? You bet it is. Look at this, this chart shows it going back to the early 70s. You can just see the cycles, right? Where it's headed, nobody knows. But the good news is that uh, that trend line is moving upward. I would make the argument that's because of some of the earlier slides we looked at. Glowing population, growing middle class, spending more dollars on beef. Those are the good things pulling that up. But we're still going to be cyclical. We're building inventory today. You suppose we'll get oversupplied again? We're already seeing prices soften a little bit because of that, right? You bet, it's a, it's a cycle, and, and the more you understand that, and the more you anticipate it, plan for it, position yourself for it, the better off you're gonna be for the long term. So uh, again, things to think about. Market volatility. I find this chart interesting just because, you know, when I, I remember, many, I'm sure you all remember when BSE hit, right? Remember the BSE thing and the market went in the tank? That's right here. At the time, we thought, oh my gosh, we've never seen volatility like that. What's happened since? More volatility, more volatility, more volatility, right? So when we talk about marketing and risk management, those things continue to be a big, big part of our business. And uh, understanding the volatility and leveraging it to our advantage becomes more critical all the time. So let me wrap up some of my comments with what I say are keys to success as uh, we look at all of our clients, as we work with over a thousand producers in agriculture, there's some things that just surface as trends that tell us, hey, if you're doing these things good, you're gonna be more successful than, than the rest, okay? So here's some, uh, some of our keys to success. One that I think in general, and I'm not picking on anybody in this room, but in general in agriculture, we're not, we're not as good at this as we should be, okay? The accounting systems, knowing your financials, really tracking it, uh, in general, we're not as good at this as we should be. And uh, there's lots of reasons for that. One of them is we're really busy 
doing the work, right? We're really busy picking out the genetics, breeding the cows, calving the cows, all those things that take a lot of effort. We're so busy and we love doing that so much we forget to, to do this other part. Um, I think our tax code makes us bad financial uh, record keepers. I really do. We've got so many loopholes. that We keep records to avoid taxes, but do we keep enough records to really manage the finances of the business? It's a big deal. And when we see producers out there doing this really well, they always outperform others. They just always do. They, they have access to more timely financial information. They make better management decisions, decisions more quickly. They're not evaluating those financial decisions once a year when they update the numbers. They update the numbers all the time on an ongoing basis, and they're always looking at them. Actual to projected enterprise analysis, real time, okay? They benchmark. These next two uh, slides are just pictures of what we'll do with our clients. We'll, we'll benchmark them against other producers that we do business with. So we'll be able to show them how do you stack up, how do you compare with some of the other producers that we, uh, that we do business with. Another, another example of a benchmarking chart. Do you benchmark against others? Do you know, I'm strong here, but I'm a little weak here. What can I do to get better in this area? Benchmarking is really, really important. Define marketing plans. They have a plan. How am I going to market my product? How am I going to get the most value out of it? They implement technology knowing about the return on investment of that technology. And that ties right into the genetics, doesn't it? Right? If we know what those genetics are going to do for us, we can, we can then calculate what's that return on investment going to be. What, what additional product am I going to have to sell? What higher quality am I going to be able to sell? What's the value of that expected to be? And you really start to know what that return on in technology is. When we see a producer out there that buys technology because the neighbor did, that almost never works, right? Everybody's operation's different. You buy technology because you know it works for you and it fits into the plan you have in your business and that's how you get to uh, better financial performance. Strong production practice goes without saying, right? If you didn't keep up with the growing carcass weights, uh, you got left behind. It's just as simple as that. Annual planning. How many of you have an annual planning session on your farm or ranch? Anybody? Yeah, a few. I see some up in the air. Yeah. Boy, you should. I, I really mean it. Uh, I, I mentioned to you at the beginning, Adam and I just got back from two days away planning for our ag division. 50 of us getting together to say, what are we going to do different in the next year? What do we got to get better at? Uh, really, really valuable time. Put a plan together and then follow it. Track it throughout the year. That's what the action plans part is. Hold yourself accountable that you're going to make progress at the things you come up with when you get together and plan for the future. Defined ongoing communication processes. Um, sometimes we see this as a real weakness in the clients we deal with, right? It's not going well, we're losing money. Dad knows that, but mom doesn't. Or dad knows that, but the son doesn't. Or the daughter doesn't, right? Is that... That's just not acceptable, right? Everybody involved in the farm, everybody that plays a key role in that farm or ranch needs to know what's going on. So do you have weekly team meetings where you get together and talk about how's it going? What do we got to do better? What's happening this week? Um, a key, key component to success. Get the HR right, right? Labor's easy, isn't it? Labor's tough, right? How, do, you, do you have a good labor plan for your farm or ranch? Here's one uh, that I think everybody needs to pause and think about. Do you know how to leverage your assets? How do you leverage the assets of your farm or ranch? Every one of your operations is different than the one person sitting next to you. So every one of you has a different plan. How do I leverage that and make it, make it better? Uh, I got to touch on the productive and non-productive. Is a, is a new house a productive asset? No. I've got some wives just giving me evil looks here. I can just see them, right? You bet, a house isn't a productive asset, is it? It doesn't, doesn't create any income. It doesn't help bring a return to the farm. Now, I'm not saying you should all live in tents out in the back, right? I'm not saying that at all, but I am saying those non-productive asset investments are really important to think about. When you're making a capital expenditure into a non-productive asset, you really got to think about it. How much are you going to put towards that, and what does that do to your business? I used the house one, but you know, in the, in the good years we just came out of, you can, you can point to a lot of other things. 
Uh, I'm aware of an operation, and I will obviously not ever share names, but I'm aware of an operation that put a $2.3 million shop up a few years ago. Productive asset, non-productive asset. Eh, depends on, right? Depends on the business. Sometimes you need really good shop facilities, depending on what you do, but I would say 2.3 might have been a little on the excessive side, right? There's some non-productiveness to some of that, in some cases, depending on that business. So again, not saying it's a bad thing to do, just saying those are the things you really got to think about. If you have an empty feedlot sitting out in your, on your place that you haven't used for years, if it's empty, it's non-productive. But if you start to use it again and generate revenue with it, now you just made it productive. So again, utilization of those assets is going to be really important. Last, uh, last slide here, leveraging big data. Leveraging big data is uh, real important in today's business. That, gen that genetic stuff, there's a lot of data there, isn't it? Sometimes it can kind of blow our mind. What, what's all that mean? The guys that understand it and can figure it out and leverage it really, really makes a difference, okay? Uh, lifelong learning, I got to preach to that. I, you know, I see so many operations that say, you know, why do you do that? Well, I do it because that's what dad did. Uh, things are changing fast in our business, folks. Uh, you know, the genetics, the technology, things are changing so fast. You know, that's a bad answer, in my opinion, if you say I'm doing it that way because that's what dad did. And that's not a knock on dad. Trust me, that's not a knock on dad at all. My only point is you gotta, you gotta keep up, you gotta stay ahead of it, and the only way you do that is to be a lifelong learner. I fibbed a little bit, there is one more slide. The other thing I would say is uh, advisory groups. Surround yourself with people that you trust and people that you value their advice and their knowledge and use that, leverage that on your business. So that's what an advisory group is. You know, and lots of people could be on there. Put people on there that cover up your weaknesses. You know, we're all good at certain things. We're all weak at certain things. Don't, don't be afraid of your weaknesses. Just find somebody that can fill the gap for you. Find an expert. You know, that can be a lot of different things to different operations. And then the other one I'd say is want to be held accountable. As a banker, one of the biggest red flags that I see is when I sit down with a client and I say, hey, I think you can do better in this area, and they get upset, right? They're mad, you know? They don't want to be held accountable. On the other hand, the ones that I see keep doing better and better is if I say, hey, based on the operations I've seen, I think you can, you can get better in this area. They embrace that. They go, really, what do, what do you think I could do to get better? How do we do that? How do we make that happen so that we get better? That's accountability, and that's healthy for all of us. I've got accountability too, right? I've got to answer to our CEO and our board of directors. That's a good thing, right? That means I have to really be working every day to, to do what I need to do to make our business better. Beef, it's what's for dinner. Thanks for your time. I'd be happy to uh, answer any quick questions if we have time, Craig. Anybody, any questions at all, I'd be happy to, happy to answer. Finance related. I'm not going to talk about genetics. I promise you that. Yes, sir. So that's a great question, uh, and the answer is it depends. Um, it's, it's always surprising to me, and I, I get a lot of media people asking, okay, it's a drought year, it's got to be a wreck, it's going to be a disaster, what's going to happen? And, and I'm not making light of the drought at all, folks. It is a tough situation, but I'm always amazed at how many producers find a way to make as much or more money in those drought years than they did in the other. Now, that takes planning, you know, back to some of the slides I showed, you got to plan for a drought, right? What's your contingency plan? How do, you, how do you prepare your operations so when they come, you're ready for it, okay? And we see operations every day that, matter of fact, I know of a few that would tell me right, right bluntly to my face, I've got, a, I've got a drought plan in my operation. And quite frankly, when I have to kick it in, I can make more money sometimes in those drought scenarios than I can otherwise. So um, it, can, it can really depend. Uh, generally speaking, it's going to drive revenue down just because there's not as much product to sell, but you'd be amazed uh, how many people know how to, you know, really plan for it and find ways to, to leverage that as, a, as an advantage instead of a disadvantage. So it can depend. Yes, sir. Yeah, you're exactly right, and there's some trend to that, although this year's kind of an interesting, right? We're, we got drought, and yet our prices haven't bounced up. You know, did, 
the market can drive that. If you're, if you're the ones in a small drought area and it's not enough to impact the market, then, then that challenge is, is there too. So you're right. Uh, you, you're able to scrape up enough feed for this year, but you've, you're going to work through your, your supplies so you don't have the excess cushion you had going into this year. Next year is when you're really going to feel the drought. So you're exactly right. Uh, that delayed effect can absolutely be there. Oh, good points. Yes, sir. Nate, DJ Richard. Yeah. Um, credit, the credit crunch that at least feels like it's happening. Where are we at in the cycle on that? What do you foresee? We've been talk talking about for years about uh, interest rates and which direction we're going to go. We've seen what we've seen. We've seen expansion in the economy. We've seen uh, deflation in commodities. So when it comes to credit, we've seen a lot of consolidation in the banks. It takes more and more credit for smaller operations to continue on. You have fewer community banks. Where are we going from here? Because it looks like if you don't consolidate quickly, uh, you could be left So I really tried to put a positive, optimistic outlook on my talk, but you're going to drag me in a place where I just I don't know how to how to handle that question other than to be real with you. So BJ's question, just for those of you that couldn't hear him, is where are we at in the credit cycle? You know, we see a lot of consolidation, uh, smaller banks consolidating. Um, you know, margins tightening, where are we at in that cycle? I, you know, my crystal ball is not perfect, just like anybody else's. I can't tell you exactly where we're headed, but I feel pretty confident in sharing a few things with you. Um, I don't think the credit crunch is even close to over. Um, I think land values are still overpriced in general. Uh, and until they correct a little bit, I think we're going to be in this tight margin environment, right? We still see land rents very high. We still see costs very high, and as long as commodity prices stay low and costs stay high, it's a tough situation, right? Uh, I hope I'm wrong. I, I hope, uh, I hope uh, land values kind of just hang in here and we climb our way out of it. But uh, it still feels like, to me, uh, things are overpriced a little bit. To your consolidation point, uh, I'll just use South Dakota as an example. If I go back 10 years ago, uh, South Dakota Bankers Association had over 100 banks in the association. Uh, so 10 years later, we're at about 70. And I think, if anything, that's only going to speed up in the next five years. Um, and and I've, I'm, not, I'm not trying to uh, be too doom and gloom here, but I'm just trying to be realistic. I just, you know, the, the, the dynamics are such today that it's really hard to be a small bank, for example. Uh, capacity, capital, all these things are working against you. And so that's going to create consolidation. And, and uh, the other thing is a lot of those small banks' ownership is no different than transitioning farms. Uh, a lot of ownership of small banks is they're ready to move out. They're ready to transition out. And the next generation doesn't want to take it over in some cases. And so their only option is to consolidate. And tough times speeds that up, right? If you're thinking about that, you're waffling on that, but you haven't made a decision and all of a sudden things get tough, then, uh, okay, time to get out. It's not much fun anymore. So uh, I hope I'm wrong again, but I, I really do think in five years we'll be down to about 50 banks in the state, something like that. Uh, again, maybe I, I hope I'm wrong, but that's... We're, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Is there talk in your industry about ways in which that transfer of credit can be applied to people to the next level? I've been in Instar, we've been part of this leadership group of trying to get new, new young people involved in this business, which is tough. Mm -hmm. But we're going to need those people, those generations. Are, are there, is that a point of focus in the, let's just say, in the American Indian system? Yeah. It gets talked about a lot across all the banking, I, you know. Make no bones about it. There's a reason we have that Keep Farmers Farming program I talked to you about, and you're hitting on it right now. Um, we put that in place for that very reason. We're worried about how do we transition the next generation into agriculture and do it in a way so that they can be viable once they get there, okay? It used to be uh, you could start out with nothing in ag and make it. Can you do that today? I'm aware, I've, in the last... 15 years, I'm aware of one operation that I know of that really started with nothing and made it. 
and uh, I'll give them, you know, they're good operators, but they're also lucky, right? They had a few things work in their favor. It's really hard to do that in agriculture. It's so capital intense, right? It costs a lot of money to be in the business we're in. Well, if you don't have it, how do you get in? It's really, really difficult. So uh, it's why we put Keep Farmers Farming in place, so that we could help successful operations today transition to that next generation in a way that those baby boomers retire and they, they still have enough income to be comfortable. They're still going to be able to live the rest of their life with dignity like they deserve and, and should. But planning goes in place so that it can transition to the next generation and they have a chance to be successful and build on it. And you can do both, but it takes planning and it's not easy planning. So, yep. Thanks for your questions. I'm sure we need to move on probably, huh? Yep. Thanks again. Uh, I'll be around a little bit.